Hi, I'm E. Lockhart. I'm the author of We Were Liars. And I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a king who had three beautiful daughters. As he grew old, he began to wonder which should inherit the kingdom since none of them had married and he had no heir. The king decided to ask his daughters to demonstrate their love for him. To the eldest princess, he said, tell me how you love me. She loved him as much as all the treasure in the kingdom. To the middle princess, he said, tell me how much you love me. She loved him with the strength of iron. To the youngest princess, he said, tell me how much you love me. This youngest princess thought for a long time before answering, and finally she said she loved him as meat loves salt. Mm -hmm. Then you do not love me at all, the king said. He threw his daughter from the castle and had the bridge drawn up for, uh, behind her so she could no longer return. Hmm. Now, this youngest princess goes into the forest with not so much as a coat or a loaf of bread. She wanders through a hard winter, taking shelter beneath trees. Eventually she arrives at an inn and gets hired as an assistant to the inn's cook. As the days and weeks go by, she learns the, the trades of the kitchen. Years pass, and the eldest princess comes to be married. For the party, the cook from the inn is to make the wedding meal. A large roast pig is served. It is the king's favorite dish, but it has been cooked without salt. The king tastes it, tastes it again, calls for the cook. The princess cook appears before her father, but she is so changed, he does not recognize her. I would not serve you salt, your majesty, she explains when he asks, for you exiled your youngest daughter for saying that it was of value. At her words, the king realizes that not only is she his daughter, she is the one who loves him best after all, she's the best one, and they live happily ever after. But what really happens then? The eldest daughter and the middle daughter have been living with the king all this time. One has been in favor one week, the other the next. They've been driven apart by their father's constant comparisons of the one to the other. Now the king yanks the kingdom from his eldest daughter, who was just married, and she's not to be queen after all. The elder sisters are furious, and as they're raging, the youngest, good-hearted, wise daughter basks in her fatherly love. But before long, she realizes the king is demented and power mad. She is stuck tending to a crazy old tyrant for the rest of her days. She will not leave him no matter how sick he becomes. Does she stay with him because she loves him as meat loves salt? Or does she stay with him because he has now promised her the kingdom? It is hard for her to tell the difference. This is my version of a universal story about parental and filial love, sibling rivalry, property, money, and madness. It is the story of King Lear by William Shakespeare, and it is the story of the fairy tale Kappa Rushes, collected by Joseph Jacobs, and of fairy tales told and retold in Italy, Pakistan, India, Germany, France, and Austria. This story was the foundation of my novel, We Were Liars, which has spent 24 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list because booksellers, reviewers, and librarians have very cannily refused to tell readers anything that it's about. <laughs> Just read it, they say. I am not telling you anything. <laughs> if I told you what it was about, I would have to lie anyway. That's the campaign for this book. That's how you make people read it. But I will tell you a little bit more. <laughs> so we were, the, we were Liars is the story of a privileged family, the Sinclair family. No one in this family is a criminal. No one is an addict. No one is a failure. The Sinclairs are charitable old money Democrats, athletic, tall, and handsome. Their smiles are wide, their chins square, and their tennis serves aggressive. There is indeed a patriarch and three beautiful grown daughters. And they live in the summertime on a windswept private island off the coast of Massachusetts. Perhaps that is all you really need to know. <laughs> I was interested in the grandchildren of the Sinclair patriarch. 
I was interested, of course, in the subject of parental and filial love, sibling rivalry, property, money, and madness that are inherent in the fairy tale that I just told you. But I was also interested in the universal experience that kids have of listening to the older generation fight, of feeling powerless and angry while adults are making a mess of things. Almost every kid has experienced this. Some experience it every day. Some just at Christmas. Some <laughs> experience it violently. Some experience it hearing you know, murmurs in a clo behind closed doors. But it is a universal. Um, and there's also a pretty universal coming of age experience that is the center, uh, center point of the novel. Um, and that is the time when usually as a teenager, very often when you go to college, you realize that you're the heroes of your childhood, your, your parents and your professors, maybe your older siblings, uh, your grandparents, they are not what you believe them to be. They are not perfect. They are probably deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. You rebel. You call them out on their racism, their privilege, their manipulations, their secrets, their crimes. And you have to do it because that is part of growing up. You reject the family of origin as part of the process by which you define yourself for yourself. You make your own identity as an adult. So We Were Liars is the heightened narrative of that common coming of age experience. The teenagers in this story fall in love. Specifically, the narrator, Cadence Sinclair Eastman, she is the heir to this Sinclair family fortune, to the private island, to the houses, to the jewelry, the money, the paintings, all of that. So she is Caucasian, privileged, and damaged by a horrible accident. And she falls in love with an outsider boy who has been summering with the Sinclair family. His name is Gatwick Patil. He is a middle class intellectual kid of Indian heritage. Things go dreadfully and catastrophically wrong as they begin to question and rebel against the values of this iconic, established Sinclair family. So this book is about, in a lot of ways, the um, unspoken racism uh, that can exist even in quite intimate relationships. The buried, unacknowledged uh, race and class prejudice um, that eventually bubbles up to the surface of this story. All that said, We Were Liars has a Lexi level of HL600L. I found this out on the internet. Um, I didn't, I didn't mean, mean for that to happen. I, I Googled it and I learned it. Uh, the HL before the 600 means it's a high interest book that is readable by struggling students. So for comparison, Kant's critique of pure reason clocks in at a lexile of 1,500. Jhumpa Lahiri's The Namesake at 1,200. Charlotte's Web, Like We Were Liars, is 600. So this is an easy book if you have struggling college students, people who might not be super college ready, people you would like to have finish the book over the summer independently. All right, so that's not every college population, definitely, but it is sometimes true, right? Okay, so um, they will not get bogged down. I would hope that they would be intellectually stimulated. It's a book that people like to fight about, they like to argue, they like to send me mean tweets about the plot twist and um, all the stuff that's happened in the story. It's a controversial book, um, by which I mean that people, people like to discuss it. They like to pass it on to somebody, make them read it, and then so that they can then talk it through uh, together. So, uh, but it's not a challenging read in terms of your reading level. One of the things the characters do is write mottos on their hands. They are teenagers, experimenting with trying on different ways of thinking as a way to explore the identities they want to shape for themselves. So writing this book, I collected famous mottos from figures like Benjamin Disraeli, hmm. never complain, never explain and Ralph Waldo Emerson, always do what you are afraid to do. These are mottos of stoicism and bravery, respectively. Or are they mottos of secrecy and stupidity? Never complain, never explain. Always do what you are afraid to do. 
you can discuss amongst yourselves later. <laughs> These mottos and many others are interrogated in We Were Liars. This is my motto for today, speak up. Um, and as I've been touring around for this book, I've written a different motto on my hands each day. And one of the things I do is discuss with the students or um, readers that I'm talking to um, what that motto is and what it's like to adopt a motto for a day, to think about um, who you want to be that day and to try on a kind of set of ethics for yourself. Anyway, these mottos are all interrogated in We Were Liars. And a lot of times people write mottos on their hands and send them to me um, by email or on Twitter. The motto that shapes the book most is from J.M. Barry, author of Peter Pan. Always be a little kinder than necessary. Or as my characters phrase it, be a little kinder than you have to. Write it down now. Go on. You can write it on your hands. You can write it on your phone. You can write it on a piece of paper. Be a little kinder than you have to. Try that motto on for size today and see how it serves you. Think about it before you go to bed. Think about whether you will adopt it again tomorrow. Be a little kinder than you have to. Thank you.